Good morning. And welcome to Lutheran Church of the Resurrection. Whether you are here in person or you are worshiping online, please know that you are not here by accident. And neither am I, for surely the Holy Spirit has called us to be here together on this day to worship God Almighty and then to leave to serve our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ out there in the world. I am Pastor Karen Liedahl. You don't have to say my last name, it's fine. Pastor Karen's good. Um, and I am honored to lead worship today. Some announcements. First of all, thank you to the anniversary committee. I understand you had a big celebration on Friday, is that right? Yeah, how was it? All right, so especially thank you to the committee who organized it all. Second, because Pastor Amlin is not here, the spiritual practices gathering will be postponed until um, another, a later date. Third, you should have received two note cards. You got two note cards? Yeah? Okay. Um, when you arrive today, if you didn't, uh, let an usher know uh, and make sure that you have those two note cards. We all will need access to them later in the service, and hopefully you have a pencil or pen. Why? Oh, the surprise, all right? <laughs> you have to just wait in su suspense. In the meantime, let's have an announcement. And thank you. I invite those of you who are able to rise to both confess your sins as well as to receive the assurance of God's forgiveness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. 
as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment 
and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from the prophet Jonah. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush, so it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and you did not grow. It came into being at night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in, where, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? Word of God, word of life. Please read responsively with me from Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to your greatness. I will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing joyfully of your righteousness. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a, matter, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege of not only believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, 
since you were having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Word of God, word of life. invite the young people to come up at this time. If you, got a, if you got a bulletin ahead of time, bring that with you. If you didn't, I have some more. I bet you were wondering what that was all about. It's good to see you. Hi. Who can give me a definition of the word generous or generosity? Yeah? Generous. Okay, giving to the poor, right? Who else has an idea of what generous or generosity is? It's okay. Hmm? Giving. giving. Giving is good. And actually, there's a lot of different words that you could use, but I think giving more than is expected is a really good way to think of generosity. Well, today I am going to be reading a story about a landlord who was full of generosity, okay? So in your bulletin, you'll, uh, especially if you turn to the page, I know, I'm sorry, you, you want one that's not upside down? Um, that's time for generosity. When I'm reading, you can either fill it out or you can do it later. And there's all kinds of other things to do on here too. It says, during Pentecost, we reach out to the world with Jesus' model of generosity. So you can do those different things. Um, I thank you for coming up. My name is Pastor Karen, by the way, and I am so happy that you came. Okay? Maybe see. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. Evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought, they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only for one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have been born the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. 
I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do so, do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And now, just as a reminder, those two cards, you'll find out soon what they are for, okay? And hopefully you have a pencil or pen. Do you live your life out of an attitude of gratitude? Or do you simply have an attitude? You know, an attitude of, wow, is me. Why don't I have, and then you can just fill in the blank. In other words, are you always looking at others with a bit of envy, jealousy? Think you deserve better? Or how about this one? Ever said, hey, that's not fair. Bet you have. <laughs> so have I, and for a whole laundry list of reasons. Now, admittedly, sometimes a strong sense of fairness can be a very good thing, especially if it motivates us to work for the justice and equality of others. Where we run into problems is that people have this tendency to be rather egocentric when it comes to fairness. That is, Fairness is what seems fair, not only to us, but also for us. We tend to measure fairness in terms of our own wants, needs, hopes, expectations, with often little or at least secondary regard for the wants and needs of others. Which brings me to Jesus' parable about these day laborers. Now, right up front, it is important to recognize that how tough it was to be a day laborer in Jesus' day. These are the folks who had no regular employment. That means they stand in the town square hoping that some landowner or some manager needs extra work done and then will hire you. Trouble is there were usually a lot more job seekers than there was work. So, if you were both healthy and lucky, you might get chosen for work. And when you were done, you'd receive a day's wage and would provide for your family for the next day. By the way, this is a little insight into the petition of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, because it was enough for one day. However, if you were unlucky or unhealthy, you'd be passed over, possibly waiting all day only to return empty-handed to face the dis disappointed looks of those who depended on you. In the parable Jesus tells, it turns out that everyone is lucky. Some are chosen early, some in the late morning, at noon, at mid-afternoon, some just an hour before quitting time. No doubt the last ones chosen were downright flabbergasted by their good fortune. Not only because they received a full day's wage for one hour of work, but because finally, after being passed over again and again, they too would be able to provide for their families for at least one more day. I can well imagine their response to the landowner's generosity would have been an attitude of gratitude. They must have felt fortunate, blessed, to have worked for the day. But the first ones hired 
had no such attitude of gratitude. Rather, they just had an attitude. Why didn't they receive more pay than the latecomers? And I suppose that it's kind of hard to blame them. I can understand that they might have expected some kind of bonus or something that they deserved more. The landowner's sense of justice doesn't quite seem fair to them or for them. On the other hand, they do receive exactly what they had been promised. If anything, the landowner is being more than fair, actually downright generous. Well, to those who are invited to work late in the day anyway. But look again at what the self-centered attitude does to the first hired grumbling day laborers. Rather than feeling fortunate, for having found work for, they, for the day, they feel unfortunate because they didn't receive more. Rather than rejoicing with these other workers who had waited all day for work, rather than being grateful that they too could return home blessed to be able to feed their families, they begrudged them for their good fortune. And rather than being grateful to the landowner who has given them an honest day's wage for an honest day's work, they grumble with resentment. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus tells this parable right after Peter declares, Lord, we have left everything and followed you. What then shall we have? It sounds as if Peter is expecting some kind of reward for sticking with Jesus from the beginning. But one doesn't have to, much, have to spend much time in the Gospels to discover that not only did Jesus have a whole different set of ideas about justice and fairness than most of us, Jesus just seemed to have a thing about extending God's welcome to everyone, especially those who were the most undeserving in the world's view. The poor and the lost and the hated and the scoundrels and the marginalized prostitutes and Gentiles, the thief on the cross, the prodigal son who had wasted his inheritance, even tax-collecting cheats like Matthew himself. Not that God doesn't offer the very same welcome to those who have faithfully been a part of God, his family from childhood. Not that God doesn't promise all believers a place in his kingdom forever. It's just that God's primary interest, like the landowner in the parable, is to simply bring in the harvest before it's too late. That is to bring as many people into the family, into his kingdom, as possible. And how's God going to do that? By putting workers into his field, workers who happen to be all needful of the very same thing, no matter when they arrive on the scene. In the parable, it's a daily wage in order to feed their families. And us, people needful of life in God's kingdom, right now, as well as forever. And so, if, if we're all needful of the same thing, and God's the only one who can give it to us, there is no room for self-centered envy and grudges towards others. They only stand in the way of God using us as, as workers in God's field, in God's mission field, with attitudes 
of gratitude. Grateful to a God who so generously gave his son to die for all of us. So grateful that we can't help but go out and share God's idea of generosity with others so that they too will gratefully want to be a part of God's workforce. But in order for God to use us, God's going to have to do a little work on us. So let me ask you, when you look at your life, what do you count? Your blessings or your misfortunes? Do you pay attention to areas of plenty in your life? Or are you always focused on what you think you lack? Do you live by gratitude or by envy? Do you, re do you view others in compassion and mercy or by believing others should get what you think they deserve. All right, so now it's time for those index cards and for your pencils. All right, you got them? Everybody got their two cards? On one card, take a moment to write down some resentment some grudge you hold in your heart. It could be something you think you lack or something of which you are envious. Questions? I'm not gonna look at them, all right? <laughs> okay, so you got a minute? Okay, did you have enough time? All right, on the other card, write some blessing, some area of abundance, something for which you are grateful. It might be something in your own life or in the life of someone else. It might be something for which you are thankful through this congregation. Okay, questions? Okay, I did it too. If you are able to put one card in each hand, you'll note that physically the cards weigh the same. Spiritually, however, one of the two is weighing you down like chains secured to an anchor wrapped tightly around your heart. The other is light as a feather. Now, I want you to make a choice. Which one do you want to toss out? Well, later, when you come up for communion, there'll be that basket. It's a garbage can. I use it for a garbage can at home. Um, throw away the one, um, that one, throw the one that you don't want in the basket. And if it's not when you come up for communion, do it before you come to the service, okay? You know, before you come and receive the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. 
And then the other one. Keep it. Take it home as a reminder. Are you living life with an attitude of gratitude or just an attitude? And then some, spend some time praying about your life as a follower of Jesus through this congregation. Because God wants to hire you to work for his kingdom and wants you to be a worker with an attitude of gratitude, generous in your financial giving, generous in your forgiving, generous in your living for the sake of those less fortunate, generous in sharing your faith with words as well as deeds, generous in how you celebrate the joys of others. You know, this is really a very exciting time for your congregation. The marking of your anniversary was a way to exp express an attitude of gratitude while celebrating what God has done and continues to do through you. But I know how it is, especially as you waited to call another pastor. It's just so easy to fall into having an attitude where God, focusing on who and what you no longer have, so now is the time to be asking and then also discussing, what is God up through next, through you? Through this mission outpost, where God hires workers for the sake of bringing God's own harvest. May God constantly be at work in all of us to create within us workers with an attitude of gratitude. Amen.
let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. God, who is gracious and merciful, teach your church to invite and welcome all. Lead us to be grateful for the blessing of community. Challenge your church to choose equity and compassion over judgment. Merciful God. God who sends the wind and the sun, you know every worm and bush by name. Help us remember that even the humblest parts of creation are precious to you. Show us how best to care for the earth and its creatures. Merciful God. God who is ready to relent from punishing. Impart your compassionate wisdom to legislators, judges, members of the military, and law enforcement. Give them courage to serve the, their communities in times of uncertainty, stress, or exhaustion. Merciful God, God who saves, direct your people who are tempted by evil ways, protect your children from calamity and disaster, strengthen all who are incarcerated, encourage all who are in despair or pain of any kind. And you are now invited to speak the names of those in, not, in need of God's healing presence. God, who is slow to anger, may we boast about the goodness of Jesus with the confidence of Paul in prison. Inspire us to find abundance in whatever vocation we are called to in the world and in service to our congregation. Merciful God, God, who abounds in steadfast love, we give thanks for the saints called to the kingdom of heaven. United with them in spirit, help us, hold us firm as we labor in this life and look to the life to come. Merciful God, remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated for the offering.
forgot something, the sharing of the peace. The peace of Christ be with you always. Share the peace in a way that you feel comfortable. And now let us pray our offertory prayer. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, and live. You may be seated.
Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts, strengthened by this food, Send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the, bo- the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious and merciful. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. is at work in you.